So, with over 20 years of experience in the STEM education field, to say Pamela Britton is passionate about math and science would be an understatement. With a master's in mathematics for teachers and a recently completed PhD thesis on addressing math content knowledge and math anxiety in a teacher education program, she has spent years seeking to understand this rich and often misunderstood subject. As part of her mission to address math anxiety, she has also written and illustrated a children's book that aims to inspire children to see math in the world around them by following the adventure of her dog, Alpha. The name of the book is actually Alpha's Adventures in Mathematics, and you can find it on lookmath.ca. I'll put that information in the chat. And you can also learn more about Pamela on her website, pambritton.ca. That too, I will put in the chat. And with that short introduction, I don't know if you're there, Pamela. Yep. <laughs> All right. I'm going to let you start. I, I'm sure everyone's here to hear you, but not me. So um, here you go. Perfect. Well, thank <laughs> you so much. Um, and it's it's a pleasure for, to present today. Um, I wanted to, to actually first start off with a thank you to the CMS uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak on a topic that I find quite interesting. Um, I've actually been involved with the, uh, the CMS in various capacities for about 10 years now. Um, I started when, uh, when I started working for the math department at the University of Toronto. Um, I was involved with the marking of their Canadian Open Math Contest. And um, most recently, I was actually a student director um, on the board. So um, I really appreciate um, I really appreciate what it is that the CMS does and, and the opportunity uh, to speak today. Um, so with that, I will share. Um, so today, um, I wanted to, to speak a little bit about uh, the math curriculum in Ontario, and kind of just um, a bit of a historical perspective on where uh, kind of where math education in the in the province has has kind of come from, and uh, hopefully a little bit, you know, where we're going to. Um, so just uh, kind of a, a little bit extra, yeah. Um, I have over twenty years uh, in the STEM fields. Um, I literally just this morning submitted my final one hundred percent done thesis. <laughs> um, so that's very exciting. Um, I'm a certified teacher. Um, at the IS level and also uh, at junior as well. And uh, as was mentioned, I, I wrote and illustrated a, a children's book. And uh, just for inspiration, uh, this beige one in the back is Alpha and the, the uh, black and white one in the front is his little sister Delta, who we got about a year or so ago. Um, so uh, I'm really passionate about uh, math education and, um, and kind of promoting it as much as possible. So, and they've both been huge inspirations. Um, so a little bit of background on kind of where this topic came from. My thesis was specifically looking at elementary teacher candidates. And what I was focusing on was their math content knowledge skills. And in my study, I found, um, or I was basically, I was looking at the effectiveness of a math content knowledge course and did it help with improving elementary teacher candidates' math content knowledge. And why this was um, basically a topic of study was at the beginning, um, I took data from 483 participants. And these were all elementary teacher candidates. So people who are eventually going to become elementary teachers. They were provided with a basic numeracy test. And on that numeracy test, over 50% of them could not pass it. And these were questions um, that dealt with order of operations, decimals, percentages, simple word problems, basically math at a grade six to eight level. Um, so a course was created to basically improve their math skills. And by the end of the course, 90% um, could pass this basic test and nearly 70% of them actually passed with a score of over 75%. So this 
this was uh, a good indication that the the course uh, was effective. But while while my study really focused on elementary teacher candidates, it actually showed a broader issue about math and society. So I decided to look at um, basically why did why is this? What is this broader issue? How have we gotten to where we are? Um, and you know, how do we basically move um, move through our uh, our education and our, our math education. Um, so kind of the best way to do that is to look at, you know, where did we come from? So the focus of the talk today actually comes from a variety of reports. Um, and these have been written and presented to governments and educational organizations in Ontario. So sort of over the past 150 years, more of the focus is kind of over the past 60 to 70 years. Um, but, um, for those of you who are, are really interested in, I'm just going to kind of do an overview of a lot of these. Um, I will provide my slides and the references at the end. Um, so anyone who's really interested in kind of doing a deeper dive into, um, any of these reports, um, that information will be provided. So as I mentioned in the abstract, uh, for this talk, over the past 150 years, the Ontario math curriculum has been under near constant scrutiny and debate. Um, people such as academic researchers, educators, administrators, government officials, parents and students have all wanted to have a say and have all struggled to really understand how do we define mathematics and how do we define math education? Um, and in this debate, a lot of questions come up, things such as, is math a science or does it more closely relate to the arts and humanities? Is it a tool for solving problems or is it a way to open our minds to critical thinking and more philosophical pursuits? What subjects in math are worthy of our attention? Do we focus on numeracy? Do we focus on geometry? Do we look at basic skills or are we looking at higher order abstract thinking? Who should be responsible for teaching math and what training should they have? Um, do we need math specialists in schools, the same as we have um, French or art or music specialists? Um, and the training also relates to what my area of research was looking at. Uh, what background and skills uh, should our elementary teachers specifically have? Um, and what pedagogy should we be following? And, um, how do we present this uh, materials? Is it better instructor led? Should we be doing more student led activities, inquiry based? Um, should we be using manipulatives? Um, and then finally, how do we assess that our students are understanding what they're being taught? So these are all kind of areas that and questions that while they aren't special to Ontario, these are kind of universal topics that are being discussed. Um, Basically, my presentation today is going to focus on a number of high profile reports um, from various organizations that have sought to at least partially answer uh, some of these questions. First, I want to take a very quick trip way back, um, and we won't stay here long, <laughs> but um, in the 17th and 18th centuries, um, the or even so far back as the 17th and 18th centuries math and academic fields in general have been they've been highly debated and um in terms of universities um in the 17th and 18th centuries um Mueller actually describes what was called fault lines um in academic education so he calls the first fault line between liberal and practically useful or mechanical knowledge. And then the liberal arts were divided into two as well. So this is what he calls his second fault line, the, the trivivum, which was grammar, logic, and rhetoric, and the quadrivivum, which was uh, arithmetic, astronomy, geometry, and music. So even so far back as this, we can see that mathematics was actually it actually falls on different parts of what are these fault lines that have been described. Math was seen as a practically useful tool. You needed to count, you needed to be able to do basic arithmetic, 
but it also, it falls under things like logic skills. And then we've also got arithmetic and geometry. So even so far back as, you know, formal academic institutions, they have struggled to define where does math sit? How do we approach it and, and where does it lie? So coming a little bit more forward now, um, between kind of uh, 18, the 1870s, so late 1800s and up to about the mid 1900s, um, our education system in Ontario was heavily influenced uh, by the European system. And the focus was actually on what was called nature study. Um, and this became very popular in the 1880s in the United States um, and um, basically related up to the curriculum that we were, we're doing, we were doing here in Canada as well. So this kind of catchphrase of nature study um, included things like outdoor education, science education, educational psychology, agriculture, vocational education, and hygiene. And it was introduced into the public schools of North America. Um, it was it was very focused on um, kind of as most education is kind of how do we live, how do we uh, operate in society, which are things like why agriculture and vocation, vocational education were included in this. Um, and in the early 1900s, we became more focused on education aimed at industrialization. Um, and this actually led to the formation of subject-based streaming. So streaming was focused on, you know, the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. <laughs> um, and we even, even today, we still have this, this focus on a more subject-based streaming in our schools. There is a lot more cross-curricular now, um, but there's still kind of that that subject-based streaming. And a lot of it came from the 1990s and kind of focus, or not, sorry, 1900s, and focusing more on um, education based on industrialization. What's interesting to note is um, while math was basically seen more of as a tool than a subject in and of itself, um, and in fact, John Seath, who was a superintendent of education at the time, actually deplored the overemphasis on mathematics and yet at the same time criticized the neglect of the sciences. So even in this kind of um, framework or idea, mass place was, um, was counterintuitive. Um, do we, how are we utilizing it? We don't want to focus on math, but we need to focus on sciences. And um, as most as most know, sciences are based on mathematics. Uh, there's a strong mathematical foundation. So, um, so even just kind of the messaging um, around it, even at this time was, was confusing. Um, now, when we get kind of to the 1950s up to about the 1990s, um, there, was, there was a shift in math's place um, and where it belonged. And we started seeing it more as instrumental to competing in an ever-changing world. And a lot of this came about because of the Soviet Union and the, uh, their technological superiority, uh, Sputnik, and um, influences from, from the Cold War. At this point, there was a greater emphasis on math. And um, the government started seeing that we needed math in order to be able to compete in a lot of these you know, technological and, um, and more innovative fields. And so in 1965, um, the government of Ontario uh, commissioned the Hall-Dennis Report, and it was officially titled Living and Learning, the Report of the Provincial Committee on the Aims and Objectives of Education in the Schools of Ontario. And there's a reason that most people refer to it just as the Hall-Dennis Report. <laughs> um, but the purpose of it was supposed to be a fresh look at education in Ontario. And what they did is they visited countries uh, from around the world. Uh, there was multiple volumes of this report and each spoke to a different uh, aspect of education. They looked at the, uh, the foundations of education. How did other countries approach it? Where did they place their, um, um, their emphasis on it? 
um, and then they wrote a report on it. Um, and part of the report did seek to define the purpose of education and math's place in it. It was, it was much broader than just math, but a good portion of it did focus on mathematics. Um, one of the big things that they really focused on was concepts rather than subjects. So it was very um, seen more as integrated and cross curricular. So they would look at counting rather than mathematics or rain rather than science. So looking at individual concepts and how they related to different areas of education. Um, it also spoke of um, the multiple modalities of students. Um, and a lot of the focus was on communication, uh, man and his environment, and man's ideas and, um, and values. And this was one of the, the things that it really focused on was that students had different gifts, um, and not all students were equally strong in all subject areas. Some had special gifts in math, art, or drama but they didn't have interest in science or math um, or other what were considered academic disciplines. Um, so they, had, they, they recommended that um, the curriculum had to provide for this. Um, and um, basically looking at how a lot of these children were branded as failures by the fact their talents didn't lie in the traditional disciplines. So it was a very, um, it was a very progressive and very open uh, report and, and, and study. Um, and it's in terms of math, uh, math was seen more of a tool again, rather than a specific subject in it. Um, though it was math, it was clearly seen as a vital skill. So um, it, as part of their, um, their focus on communication, they believed that together with simple mathematics, um, this was the skills that students needed and they had to be measured and they had to have an acceptable standard. So they were even talking at that point about um, uh, specific mathematical standards. And we'll talk a little bit about that when we get to about 1995. <laughs> um, so math was definitely seen as a vital skill and they believe that students need to have a solid foundation in it, but the, the exact role or how that was done was actually never clarified um, in, the, uh, in the report. But um, the one thing that they did mention uh, very clearly is that there needed to be stronger links with the research taking place at academic institutions and how that had to be relayed um, and how we needed to basically bring together what was taking place at universities and bringing it directly to teachers. Now, unfortunately, uh, the report um, was not, the implementation of the report was not handled very well. Um, it was supposed to have been, or the, the committee had assumed that it was going to be handed over to the newly formed uh, Ontario Institute for Studies and Education, also known as OISE, um, and that they uh, now carried a monolithic responsibility in the areas of education, research, curriculum, development, and graduate studies and education. However, when it was actually released, um, it was not, um, it was not uh, released in that way. And uh, it was given directly to a lot of principals and teachers uh, directly. And some basically said that it's unrealistic. Um, you can't follow this. Some even called it dangerous. Um, and, but others, uh, more forward thinking uh, principals and school boards actually did try to implement it. Um, but they didn't, they didn't have the, the skills um, to implement it. So um, uh, Memon um, actually wrote about how it was implemented and how it was, it was handled very poorly. And in a lot of cases, um, it felt that it was served up more as a coffee table brochure. Um, so some kind of read it and said, we can't use this. This is, uh, this is unrealistic. Whereas others wholeheartedly took to it and said, this is amazing, we need to do this right now. And sadly, what this actually led to was a curriculum that was implemented without teacher input um, and, uh, or teacher preparation. And what ended up happening was 
One day teachers were told about open classrooms and the next day they walked into schools with no walls. Um, so it was, it was drastic sometimes, some of the changes. So it was not widely implemented. Um, now, shortly after this in the 1950s and 60s, um, something called the new math came out. And if you speak to anyone, or if you happen to be one of those people who went to school probably in the 1950s to 70s, maybe even the 1980s, most of them will have a story or an opinion about new math. <laughs> um, I won't read the entire quote, um, but basically the old math emphasized repetitive calculations and rigid algorithms repeated examples and grading was based entirely on the ability to do calculations exactly as instructed quickly and accurately. And in high school, it was arithmetic plus some rote geometry and algebra. The new math um, replaced class time spent on rote practice with deeper explanations of what was being done. It introduced abstraction, modular arithmetic, inequalities, symbolic logic, abstract algebra and other topics normally considered advanced were taught to the youngest children and students were encouraged to think about things and use logic and abstraction to come up with successful non-obvious answers. From a personal standpoint, I think the goals of the new math were very well intentioned and they were lofty, but they require very high levels of math knowledge by the teachers. And um, even as I was, like I was mentioning at the very beginning with my study, um, we're seeing that a lot of these elementary teachers don't necessarily have these basic numeracy skills. So trying to ask them to do things with abstraction and um, advanced level topics in math first requires um, preparation. So when the new math was put in, it was similar to what happened with the Hall Dennis report, where people said this is a fantastic idea, but they didn't necessarily um, prepare the teachers with the knowledge that they required in order to be able to effectively teach. Um, it's the same as showing up in their classroom and you have no walls the next day. So we now move into uh, 1990 to 95, and a lot of things happened actually um, in this kind of five year span. The first was um, in 1993, the province uh, established the Royal Commission on Learning, and their mission was to ensure that Ontario's youth are well prepared for the challenges of the 21st century. And um, their report uh, that came out in 1995 um, had a much shorter title, uh, just for the love of learning. Um, and the report basically suggested vision and actions to guide um, how elementary and secondary education in the province would work. Um, and it needed to include things like values, goals, programs of schools, and then how do we, how do we hold these uh, educational institutions accountable? So for the love of learning came nearly 30 years after the Hall Dennis report. Um, it, one of its main focuses was that education should be a collaboration between schools. Um, schools should be teaching basic competencies and business and industry um, who would teach advanced technologies. There was a big focus on um, that we needed to prepare students more by understanding how technology works. And as we can see kind of from where we are today, um, technology plays a huge role in education. And in the 90s, they were seeing um, the, basically the beginnings of that. There was a big focus also on metacognitive strategies. They wanted to think, they wanted students to be thinking about thinking. And math was actually uh, proposed as a tool for being able to think about that. Um, they started challenging the standardization uh, from the 1960s and 70s and started to focus on uh, competing globally in education. They also pulled a lot from new math concepts. Um, and they saw math again, mostly as a tool. It was applied directly to science, technology and business, but it had a much, uh, a much more prevalent um, application at this point. The other thing that they called for was the de-streaming of students. And as we know today, um, students are still streamed 
uh, mostly. There are some that are starting to move to de-streaming and I know that there's, um, there's plans to move more towards de-streaming. Um, but it's, it's still the whole idea of even in the 19, early 1990s, they were calling for the de-streaming of, of students. Um, so around the same time, the EQAO, the uh, first established as the educate, sorry, established as the Education Quality and Accountability Office. Um, and this actually came out at the same time as the, um, the For the Love of Learning report. And the purpose of the EQAO was to assess the abilities of students in grades three, six, and nine on their math and literacy skills. And the assessments were basically designed as part of, as we saw in For the Love of Learning, um, the accountability piece. How do, we, how do we really know that what we're doing is, is working and making a difference? So uh, the EQA was formed and they started with standardized testing. They refer to themselves as a world-class, large-scale testing organization that provides valuable services to the people of Ontario with a focus on improving student learning. So when they were established, this was their, uh, this was their goal and it still continues to, that's, that's still how they present themselves. Um, they focus on accountability, measurable benchmarks and providing uh, information. And their basically role was to evaluate the effectiveness of the curriculum and um, provide policymakers with information so that we could change the curriculum um, associated with the results that they were getting. Um, the one interesting thing to note is that this is actually a break from many of the reports that had come before, uh, which spoke of moving away from standardization and um, recognizing individual student strengths. The EQAO is very much a standardization test. Um, so it's, it's interesting to kind of see at the same time, there were two very different um, things coming out of the same government. Um, also recently, the EQAO has been responsible for the math proficiency test, um, which is required for um, teachers to basically write and pass in order to be certified in the province of Ontario now. Um, what is interesting about the EQ, or sorry, the math proficiency test is the EQAO itself even released a report stating that um, there is a weak and not universal correlation between teacher competency scores and student outcomes and issues with, um, and also about issues with recruitment uh, from minority ethnic groups. So the, the math proficiency test has also um, been somewhat controversial in, is it really effective? Um, are, we, um, are we actually testing uh, what we need to be? And are we affecting those who become teachers because of it? Um, even in my research, I spoke with many teacher candidates about the math proficiency test. And while all of them decided to continue with their, um, with their schooling, with their education, um, a number of them actually seriously considered not, not going through um, because they knew that if they spent, they would have to spend two years in an education program, then they'd have to pass this test. And if they didn't pass this test, it basically negated the two years of education that they just finished. Um, so it's definitely um, both the EQAO and the, the math proficiency test have um, a fair amount of controversy uh, associated with them. But they're an important part of our education system and, um, and what we focus on um, and how we make decisions on a lot of our curriculum. The other um, kind of area um, that has been really uh, vocal about um, basically math education in the province. So this is outside of uh, government commissioned reports is things like math institutions and associations. So many institutions have also written reports and have attempted to have their say on the matter uh, of math education. Um, two of the ones that I wanted to focus on specifically today 
Um, and there are many um, others out there, uh, the Canadian Mass Society, uh, OI, like the OISE, uh, and um, other universities, but two institutions that really kind of uh, come to the forefront with a lot of this are the Ontario Association of Math Educators, uh, which was actually established in 1860 um, as the Ontario Teachers Association. And as early as 1891 uh, began providing a forum for those people who were interested in advocating about how mathematics uh, should be taught. Um, and what's interesting to note is that the first teachers unions in Ontario actually didn't come about until about 1918. So this organization was actually formed before teachers unions. Um, they uh, advocated for the inclusion of geometry into the curriculum. And they also uh, were basically one of the, uh, the people who pushed for the adoption of the metric system. And that was in 1901. Um, in 1960, they even wrote textbooks uh, focusing on the new math. And they were very, uh, very vocal and very um, instrumental in um, how, how math education was um, approached within the, within the province. And even today, um, they have been, they've been working hard to make lots of resources on the brand new curriculum that just came out, um, adding things on financial literacy and um, socio-emotional learning as it relates to math. And um, so they've been, they've been uh, working uh, in collaboration uh, with a lot of other um, math researchers and math organizations on things like that. Um, the other one is the Fields Institute. Now the Fields Institute is specifically dedicated to mostly to research in the mathematical sciences. Um, but in 2013, they actually wrote a report on elementary teacher candidate math requirements. Um, in the province uh, of Ontario, elementary math teachers are not required to have any uh, courses in university level mathematics. Um, and this was something that um, the Fields Institute and, and members of uh, the Math Content, Math, Math Knowledge Network um, worked to basically bring to light and address. Um, so they have, um, they have been vocal in the, if we want good math students, uh, we need good math teachers. And this is, these are ways that we can help um, to create those. So, these are basically when we look at this it's to give us an idea of what others have found and how can we how can we put it all together so what can we learn from the past are there things from these reports that we can bring into today are there things from these reports that have been brought into today and are there things that um we need to possibly go back and reevaluate and take a look at um, how has the past year uh, specifically changed our perceptions of math education and math curriculum and how we how we teach mathematics. Um, there's also the how do we define math and uh, do we need to necessarily um, one researcher uh, Lelowin uh, speaks of the the holy grail of uh, mathematics for understanding and that everyone has a slightly different idea of what math is, um, how, do we, how do we teach it, kind of all those questions that I was asking at the very beginning um, and the kind of the never ending search for an answer to that question. And I wanted to end this off um, with um, a, very, very recent report uh, that just came out uh, by Baker. Um, and it basically, what they did is they had a survey and they looked at pre and post pandemic themes uh, in math education. And what they were able to do from this is they actually created this, they worked with a, a student artist and created this lovely um, illustration that broke down many of the themes um, that came up from their surveys. Um, and 
in the in the references that I provide, there is a reference to this paper where they actually break down each of the um, areas of this image and speak about the different um, areas. So there's things like the Parabola Mountain, um, the the dark clouds of mathematics that follow some students around, the um, the Escher like hand that links mathematics and art together. Um, but what they what the themes that they found and these are, are fairly generic themes were things like what approaches to teaching uh, should we take so teaching strategies and curriculum um, and how have they changed kind of pre and post pandemic uh, what are the goals of math education both societal and educational uh, what's the relation of math education to other practices how does it interconnect um, teacher professional development technology integrations, equity, diversity, and inclusion, uh, effect, and of course, assessment. <laughs> um, and this, this image was, was really created um, to show how overlapping each of those themes are and how we can't necessarily look at any one of these individuals um, on its own. We really need to be looking at integrating all of these different um, pieces of information uh, to really to really give us a strong foundation on how do we how do we approach math education um, and as promised um, a number of references associated with the talk i will make sure that the slides are made available to anyone who is interested um, but that is kind of a quick little um, 150 year um, journey through um, through mathematics education and curriculum um, in the province of Ontario. <laughs> um, so I will, I would happily take uh, any questions that uh, that people might have. Thank you, Pamela. Uh, that was uh, 150 years in 40 minutes. Uh, <laughs> um, I just want to uh, remind everyone that this session is recorded and the recording will be made available to everyone who registered. So uh, I'll just send an email after in a few days with the recording to, for those who arrived late or who had to leave early. All right, if there are any questions. Um, so I'm seeing uh, a net. Yes. <laughs> Hi. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was very interesting. Could you? I'm interested in just one as many aspects of you, that you spoke of, but particularly one comment you made uh, uh, about the socio-emotional learning as it relates to math. What What is that all about? <laughs> um. So. I, I will admit I have not had a chance to do kind of a deep dive into the new. Um, my understanding is it does have, uh, it does actually have connections to that kind of metacognitive thinking. Okay. Um, and it does uh, um, also look at things like math anxiety. So if you have math anxiety and reflecting on, um, or not even if you have math anxiety, sorry, but just the general uh, reflecting on how do you approach math? Um, how does math make you feel? Um, how do you, um, basically, how do you relate to the subject? Um, but yeah, it's it's a very new, um, it's a very new addition to the curriculum. Oh, okay. um, and I think it's one that a lot of people are trying to figure out how do we approach it? Um, and of course, I do open it up because I'm I, I'm, I'm guessing that there might be some uh, some current teachers here. So if at any point anybody would like to jump in with uh, more information on any of it, I'm happy to, to share Spotlight. <laughs> Anton? Um, hello, thanks so much for the for the presentation. So the question that I, so the, the thing that surprised me the most, I would say from, from this, talk is that the importance of metacognitive meta skills and metacognitive strategies was emphasized as early as like 1995 and yet 25 years later when our, I, I see first year students arriving so so few of them know um, like basic soft for example um, meta, like me, great metacognitive strategies you know they some a lot of them are surprised that oh my god rereading for three hours doesn't really work or cramming is not a very good thing you know um, like it leads to short-term 
learning, but doesn't lead to long-term learning, you know? So I guess my question is, um, is like, um, is this emphasized in teachers' education in Ontario? Like, I mean, are teachers presented with, uh, for example, recent results in cognitive psychology, recent strategies for implementing, um, for using uh, knowledge of how our brain works? Or are they taught these, these great um, uh, strategies for, I don't know, like active reading, like SQ3R method or things like that? Thanks. Yeah. Um, so I can only, um, I can only speak to kind of the OISE program. Um, uh, I'm assuming that it's, it's fairly similar across um, other, um, like other university programs. Um, but there is, there is a, a focus um, with teacher programs on, um, you know, how do students think? How do they learn? How do they process information? Um, so that is definitely um, in, in parts of their, you know, their pedagogy courses and um, other um, kind of requirements for the teacher education uh, programming. Um, so it's definitely, it's something that the teachers are taking, um, taking courses in. Um, what I have found is that uh, when it comes to math specifically, um, if they are lacking in the, the content knowledge portion, it becomes much more difficult for them to actually implement a lot of these, um, these kind of thinking skills because it really, under, or it really requires understanding, um, understanding the math itself, understanding what the math is, is teaching. And um, that gives you kind of the more insight into um, how are we thinking about it? Um, so it's it's kind of a pairing of the two, um, where um, right now they, they are getting you know solid pedagogy on how to teach math, but if those kind of content knowledge skills are are lacking, it becomes hard to kind of realize um, how are students approaching problems, where are they struggling, um, you know, kind of the, those areas. Yeah, yeah, I guess I guess what the way I envision it is that I mean, if you look at the like Bloom's taxonomy pyramid, right? If they, if a, if a teacher himself is not on top of this pyramid, it's hard to ask student to climb to climb on top as well, right? So, yeah. before I um, Elena asks her question, I just want to mention that Jeff also said the two most recent issues of OI Gazette has lots on SEL in the curriculum too. Um, Elena. Uh, hi, thank you. Um, hi, thank you for the presentation. Um, my question is about um, this uh, uh, mathematical knowledge for teaching. Um, uh, should we distinguish between fluency in mathematics and deep understanding of mathematics? Uh, because uh, from my experience with future teachers, uh, what I see, uh, even the students who are very fluent in mathematics and can produce uh, a beautiful solution uh, for a complex problem, they still unable to explain their own reasoning or thinking, how they get to this solution. Uh, so it's uh, fluency is not all <laughs> they need. <laughs> so what do you think about this? Um, so I think um, given um, given kind of the the underlying knowledge, um, like I, as I was mentioning, without any interventions, um, you know, over fifty percent of incoming teacher candidates um, in the program I was looking at couldn't do basic numeracy, um, and so by we needed to first build their um, their general, you know kind of scaffolded knowledge, you know, build their numeracy skills, um, which kind of leads to some of the, the fluency with it. But as a lot of the reports um, spoke of, that metacognition uh, portion is, is just as important. And I think a lot of this goes to the, the, the kind of debate that, that seems to be fairly constant um, in you know, um, you know, I've seen tons of news reports where it's, do we return to rote? 
Um, you know, that, that kind of return to rote, should we just be, you know, building that fluency um, or should we be looking at something more like uh, what the new math was, was promoting, you know, those higher order, those abstraction skills. And, um, and it's, it's, it's kind of a constant debate. Um, and some people, some people will say that you can't have the higher abstraction thinking without the fluency. You need those rote skills. You need to basically know your memory, your, your multiplication tables, you know, backwards and forwards in order to be able to do the higher um, learning. Um, whereas other people say, well, no, by doing the higher order learning, it encourages students to want to do the more rote um, learning. Um, I tend to fall on the, the second half of it, um, where I think if we, if we can showcase some of the amazing mathematics that goes on in academia, um, we're going to inspire students to want to understand uh, and build their fluency because th they need, um, they need those skills to be able to, to kind of dive deeper into some of these more abstract topics in math, um, which I believe is where a lot of the beauty of mathematics lies. Um, and yeah, so I mean, it's one of those where it's, um, the, the question also becomes about, well, if we've got technology now, you know, do we need to necessarily, um, do we need to necessarily push the, um, you know, you need to, do you need to memorize all of your multiplication skills because um, you can just have, you know, a calculator kind of um, help you with it. So it's, it's definitely, it's, it's a, it's a very good kind of two-sided uh, question. Uh, just uh, want to add, uh, I, I completely disagree with the, this um, approach. We don't need multiplication table, we don't need this, we don't need this. Uh, especially for the elementary school, we always uh, mixed up uh, things that um, should be taught uh, uh, in uh, secondary school. And the things that we're supposed to build in elementary school. In elementary school, we build understanding. Uh, and without some memorization, without the multiplication table, it's very difficult to build understanding. It's not to, to produce some calculations, it's to build understanding we need some elements of memorization. Uh, and um, uh, also, uh, for elementary school, it's very special. Uh, even if you ask a mathematician, it's very fluent in mathematics, uh, PhD in mathematics, and you, you ask uh, the person who never taught in elementary school to explain something to a child seven years old, uh, the person will probably fail. So it's not so much about abs or, uh, about abstract or no, not abstract, because about advanced mathematics. It's not about advanced mathematics, but it's about really deep understanding of concepts taught in elementary school. And this really interesting subject, and we need to learn much more about this, in, uh, not mixed up with uh, secondary mathematics or with college mathematics or technology or mathematics we need for technology or for something else. Elementary school is to build thinking. It's like this. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. And it's, I mean, you, you, you've, you've hit on um, kind of the whole, um, kind of the whole kind of premise of, um, of, of kind of what I was showing is it's, there's so many different facets to it. There's so many different things that we have to take into account and um, different uh, kind of areas that we can focus on. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely a complex um, it's definitely a complex area, and uh, I'm I'm a big believer that um, we need to carefully um, teach elementary school students um, kind of those more abstract um, areas uh, of math. And I I also strongly believe that we should be teaching proofs um, to even starting in elementary school. You know, tell me why two plus two equals four. 
um, and working them through kind of formal proofs and that, because it's, again, it's that metacognition we need to, they need to know why they're, why they're thinking the way they're doing and why they're approaching it the way they are. <laughs> Thank you. And, 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 and then Olga. Okay, thanks. Um, I, I'd like to maybe just make sure that we, I feel like we're going back and forth between two different subjects and I'm getting mixed up about which one we're talking about. So I'm, I really feel there's quite a distinction between what teachers need to know to support student learning and what we would like students to know. So if, if we're talking about teachers, which I think we started out talking about teachers, but we, I, I feel like we've kind of generalized into what students might in the end be expected to know or how they might learn. But I, I'd love to bring us back to where we started, which was talking about teachers. What is it that teachers need? And I really appreciated the comments around specialized content knowledge in particular. Um, and certainly my work has focused on that. Like there are things that teachers need that are unique and are special and are different from their mathematical experience in the past, no matter what level they reached, even those uh, teacher candidates with advanced university math background struggle with specialized content knowledge when it comes to developing the reasoning around fundamental element, elementary concepts. And until we get to the stage where we're all on the same page about supporting that, I think we'll always have teachers that have what, I, I mean, personally, I the term math anxiety is not one that I'm willing to, to sign on for because to me an anxiety is, is an irrational fear. I don't think our teachers have math anxiety. I think they have a rational awareness of their lack of deep understanding. I, I wouldn't call that an anxiety. They're, they know that they need more deep understanding. And when they get a chance to develop that, their world changes. They just, their body language changes. They, they develop a, a confidence and a love of math that they, they've never had before. And I think, I think we have to remember that that is particular to teaching and doesn't necessarily generalize to, you know, what we want all our students to know. Um, anyway, I, last comment, I really appreciated the, the comment around proof. I wouldn't call it proof, I would call it reasoning, but we can use whatever word we want. The point is we need that understanding, but if the teachers don't know how to support its development, then it's, it's, you know, it's kind of a moot point in terms of expecting students to, uh, to develop that. So I, I'm just, I, I would, I guess I'm, I'm asking for people to like, decide what it is we're talking about, right? Are we talking about students learning or are we ta talking about what teachers need in terms of facilitating that uh, so we don't sort of lose track about the, you know, there's more than one subject going on. Anyway, I'll stop, thank you. <laughs> um, well, actually it's, it, um, I, I noticed like yours is actually one of the, the reports um, that I was commenting on, uh, the one from Fields with um, the, the background on, um, on basically what to like, you know, what do math teachers um, require, um, and that, and I think that, um, yeah, I think very much so. Like the the research that I was doing, um, one of the biggest things that we saw was when we started when we started addressing the math content knowledge uh, with the students, and we started building their skills we started addressing their, uh, their attitude towards math, um, very much so. Um, they were, they became much more confident. Um, there were students who, when they found out they had to take a math content knowledge course, were like, I need to quit right now. Like, I can't do this. And then when they got into their practicum placements, um, one of them had a grade eight class and the teacher said, oh, I know math's not your strong suit. Do you want me to do the math for this? And she was like, no, I can do this. I can, I can totally do this. And this is someone who scored very low on the initial um, test. So, um, so I, I, I definitely agree that it's, we need to be, when we're looking at teachers, we need to be addressing their content knowledge, but also their attitude. Um, towards the subject because research has definitely shown that that attitude gets passed on to their students. And if they've got this, um, 
whether you call it anxiety or whether you call it, you know, a hesitancy or a lack of confidence, if they've got it themselves, they will pass it on to their, their students. And so the two are very, the two are very interconnected. And um, I think that's something that even like throughout all the reports that I was, I was presenting on um, is that, is that all of these issues are highly interconnected with each other. And um, when we address one, it's going to have an impact or an effect on uh, the other one. And um, while we do need to kind of separate out how we are approaching, um, I think it's important to keep in mind that there's, there's gonna be connections between the two. Olga? Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for a much, uh, very much, uh, you know, I learned a lot uh, from your presentation. So thank you for a very interesting um, uh, presentation. Um, just to continue with this uh, division between concepts, what is it that we are talking about? I would like to refer back to what Elena said, uh, the need to uh, the, 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 uh, the uh, differentiating between fluency and deep thinking. And so why is it related and how is it related to your work on uh, the uh, whole Dennis report? Um, um, I think, um, this is one of the reasons why I was very interested, um, you know, keen on hearing what you have to say, because we need to have a look back about the shifts that happened and, uh, and, and why they happened in terms of how it, uh, math education should look like. Um, I am uh, a, I suspect that if we look more deeply into these shifts, right, historical shifts, we would uh, see that uh, what Elena was speaking about was much celebrated. We, uh, or I hope that what um, uh, uh, we will see, we uh, the uh, need to focus less on fluency and really allow students uh, to develop deep understanding uh, between um, uh, concepts and relationship between mathematical concepts. And that goes back to uh, what was said before by the previous uh, speaker, uh, when she said, are, are we talking about teachers or students? What are we talking about? My, my uh, guess uh, is that uh, students, um, teachers are also students, they learn, right? So, I mean, um, uh, in, and, uh, in our teacher education programs, especially here in Ontario, we are trying our best to uh, cause them to relearn or to, to reformulate their approaches uh, or their thinking about uh, a, a, you know, their, themselves as users of mathematics. So, so um, I do not think that we get uh, we will get to um, you know final answers after this presentation. But uh, a, um, I really appreciate this opportunity to uh, resurface very important questions about reasoning and about proof and about uh, what is it that we want teachers to be able to do, what is it that we want uh, students to be able to do. Um, just one a last uh, comment. Uh, through your presentation, I, I noticed that uh, maybe without using the, the term that you talked about TPAC, I did not really catch how this um, uh, a, uh, overview, the historical overview, um, shows the uh, differences and changes in technology, uh, pedagogy, and content knowledge. What I heard, and maybe I didn't hear well enough, uh, is focus on content, but I I'm really interested in hearing more about shifts in pedagogy and shifts in approaches to uh, um, uh, technology. Now, obviously, in the 1960s, when the report was uh, published, <laughs> technology wasn't as advanced as it is today, but uh, I'm curious to uh, see, to hear what what, um, what was there in place back then? That was a long time ago. Yeah, um, well, as I mentioned, this is, um, this kind of topic is more a um, kind of just an interest area of mine. Um, it's, um, so I, I wouldn't have the, the direct answer on that. Um, the last paper that I was mentioning about, um, the one where they were basically doing the pre-pandemic and, uh, Keep wanting to say post-pandemic. 
um, and the current situation, um, they actually addressed um, a, a fair amount about technology and um, and and kind of uh, like what you were saying with the TPAC, like how do we bring all of this together and and how has um, how are our approaches um, to a lot of this changed and also what kind of um, like those those eight themes that they had listed. Um, how do they interconnect with each other? So how does assessment link with um, with uh, like equity and technology and what are the goals of our um, education? So um, so there is research out there um, that is looking at, you know, how does um, how do all those kind of link up together? Um, basically what I was hoping to do today, and it, it seems like I've been able to do that, um, is to give kind of a general overview to get people thinking about, well, if they were doing this, and it's like exactly what you asked, what kind of technology were they um, thinking about in the 1960s? Or were they thinking about technology in the 1960s? Or were they looking at just continuing on with the uh, industrialization uh, of the education and how did you know how did technology changes in the 1990s because um, that was definitely prevalent um, for the love of learning really actually spoke a lot um, about um, technology and the fact that we were now faced with you know a world I don't I don't even think they envisioned where we were going to end up with technology um, but they knew that it was, it had, it had to be a part of education. Um, so, and that's one of the reasons too, why I said, like, I will, I will definitely make all of my references uh, available to people, because I think that there are, there are definitely areas to, to kind of deep dive into um, a lot of these. Um, I was just more kind of uh, broad strokes across um, what, what had been done. But yeah, there's definitely, um, I think, I think more now we are looking at the integrations um, across these different areas. I don't know how um, how deeply the Hall Dennis report um, would have gone into that, um, but I know for the love of learning, definitely did. Um, they were they were very about the integrations and how everything kind of correlated with one another. Dad. Hi. Hello, everybody. Um, can you hear me okay, uh, future Dr. Britton? <laughs> That's exciting to hand that in today, no doubt at all. Uh, thank you so much for the great talk. A whirlwind for, for a side uh, tangential interest there. You've done a very thorough job. So <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, I've learned a lot of things myself today. I did not know OME was involved in supporting the metric system adoption. The, all kinds of things you said there today. Uh, just a few quick comments. Um, Hall Dennis report. Uh, you mentioned a beautiful coffee table. I've been trying to get a copy of that. My, my supervisor, when I was a PhD student, always brought it out every class because he thought it was so beautiful. And I'm trying to get a hold of a copy. So if you see a copy at OISI or something, you got to let me know that it's available. Um, a, a few quick comments. You mentioned about, uh, I work a lot with elementary teachers, as does Anne and, and I think Jamie, at least on the call today. And uh, of course, getting them ready uh, or having them produce these good math teachers, quote unquote, uh, what kind of strategies help with that? You've mentioned some of them already today, and there's no uh, surefire uh, you know, solution. Is it a matter of making some high school courses mandatory? Is it making them take courses before they enter the B.Ed.? Is it making them write tests while they're in the B.Ed. content uh, area tests? Is it making them write a, a, an exit test like we have now with this MPT uh, being challenged in the courts? So, uh, all of these things run the danger of discouraging teachers going into the profession, like you said. And so the, none of them seem to be a great <laughs> way forward, but uh, the, there, there, there has to be a better way, I suppose you could say. I think you've touched on some of those uh, aspirations, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm feeling older every time I hear a talk like this. I, don't, I can't talk for anybody else on the call, but I've lived through more and more of the things in your bulleted list. <laughs> I was alive when that happened, uh, and I was teaching when that happened, and so uh, the cycles always amaze me, right? Even the de-streaming topic you brought up, you know, went to a point where it was de-streamed, then we de-streamed when I was a student, then we went to no streaming, and now I'm reviewing the new grade nine in Ontario, and it's going back to a, a non-streaming model in nine, so these things do have a way to cycle around, and it makes me think that 
it's good because we're always talking about the pros and the cons and and which ways maybe are better for students and teachers uh but they aren't simple they're complex like you said so it's it's uh uh so that part is true i'll just leave you with two pieces i think one of your key areas is stem right you started off by being introduced as a stem area person and that's one of my interests too so just just uh food for your own mind as we uh end off today uh shortly um JKU, you might want to jot it down, is the Johann Kepler um, University in Linz, Austria. And I've been uh, tuning into a few conferences with them through someone I know who works there. And, and they are really, they've set up a new center now for STEM focus. And it's kind of like a world leader. And the stuff they're doing is amazing, Pamela. So if you're keen on an area of what's happening in Europe, uh, check their stuff out with, uh, you know, augmented reality and 3D printers and laser printing and 3D modeling and all kinds of new things that are available and, and coming down in price. So, uh, and also there's a conference you probably heard about that uh, UBC is putting on in July this year. The deadline for early bird is three days away or something. It's on STEM focus, something you may want to check out in all your spare time in July when you collapse <laughs> from finishing your PhD. Anyways, thank you very much. Great job. Thank you. And um, yeah, that's actually, um, you were just talking about the, um, you know, the, the, you know, how do we approach it? And that's actually that that was the, that was actually the main focus of my thesis was the, the different ways that we can approach the teacher education. So, um, so hopefully that'll be public, um, publicly accessible at some point for, uh, for people who are interested. <laughs> are there any other questions? If not, uh, I'm going to thank you once again, uh, Dr. Burton, Pamela, uh, for uh, for this really, really enriching uh, webinar. And uh, I'll remind everyone that uh, the recording will be available and uh, we'll send it to you in a few days. Did you have any more comments, Pamela? Anything? Well, I just wanted to say thank you um, for allowing me to present on uh, on, like I say, kind of a just um, uh, a topic of uh, of tangential interests, <laughs> I think, as Dan said, um, that uh, you know I, I've done I've done a bit of research on, and I find it really interesting to to look at where we've been to try and figure out where we're going. And um, I'm just I'm so passionate about like math education that it's um, I want to learn as much about where we've been in order to see what the potential for you know where we can go with it so that's awesome hopefully we can uh somehow continue these uh webinars and you can uh give us a follow-up maybe next year <laughs> post pandemic uh, post -pand <laughs> hopefully how, how has post pandemic, pandemic changed math yes. education <laughs> yes all right thank you everyone thank you for being here uh and uh, we'll see you during other webinars. We have two more. We'll have one Thursday and one next week. The Thursday one is about mentorship and next week is uh, about uh, more abstract math theory. All right, bye-bye.